Chapter 27. For several long moments, no one said anything. Kalen and everyone else stared at the man who just appeared. He was lying on the ground and looking happily up at the late morning sky. He was old, Kalen supposed, but not as old as you would expect someone to look after more than 400 years. Everyone had said that time must move differently wherever the mage had been sent to, but Kalen had never really understood how that worked. In any case, the man seemed older than Sarek, but not as old as Anders. His hair was gray and hung raggedly around his shoulders, and he had a scraggly gray beard as well. But his clothing seemed well made, and not nearly as worn and dirty as it should be, as if he had perhaps kept it aside all these years, waiting for the day he would wear it upon his return. Finally, Mage Krellick himself broke the silence. He sat up with a grunt and looked around. Then he seemed to notice his burned hand for the first time. Huh, he said mildly, can't have that now, can I? He didn't move or even take a moment to focus, but at once a green and yellow glow surrounded his hand and his forearm, almost solid in its intensity of color and brightness. Kalen actually had to squint and then look away. It was like trying to watch the sun. Well, if the sun was partly green, anyway. When Kalen looked back, it was as though the hand had never been injured at all. Mage Crowley glanced up at San Eva, who was clutching her own burned hand, and then the bright glow surrounded her hand as well. She gasped. The sensation of a healing that significant and fast must be intense, if not painful. Although the mage himself hadn't seemed to feel anything when he'd healed himself, or at least he hadn't shown it. Thank you, San Eva said, sounding shaken. She held out her hand and gazed at it in wonder. Then she seemed to come back to herself and offered her hand to Mage Krellick to help him up. He waved it off, though, and stood up on his own. So then, my dear, he said to her, how have you prepared for me? Everything you required has been accomplished, San Eva told him. The men you see here are a mere fraction of the army I've assembled for you. The others are gathered in several different locations, as you instructed. We have more than a hundred Slara, and I believe there are still a few more that might be brought over. The Magistratum rips itself apart from within, and the war is beginning. It will no doubt spark other conflicts as allies are drawn into the fight. Excellent, he said, nodding. Then he suddenly noticed Sarek, still trapped behind his oddly solidified magic shield. Oh, ho, ho, Mage Carlick shouted, grinning. Is this one of my esteemed colleagues from the Magistratum? He began to laugh again. Oh, it is such a pleasure to meet you. We have many things to discuss, you and I, and all your friends. Carlick turned away as though dismissing Sarek from his mind. Then he seemed to notice Kaelin, Marl, and Willem for the first time. And what is this? Playing pieces, master, said Eva said. The girl is a younger princess of Trellian. Yes, yes, I'm sure they've served whatever purpose they were supposed to, the mage interrupted. They are not needed any longer? Said Eva's confident expression shifted slightly. She glanced at Willem. I'm, I'm not certain. It seems best to, to wait and see, master. I don't like loose ends. I know. I promise I will take care of it. He looked at her. Is there something you are keeping from me? I am tired, said Eva. I do not have time for secret games. I must rest and regain my strength before I am called upon to use it. Destroy them and be done with it. Marl gasped in horror. horror. Kalen wished he could say something to comfort her, but even if he hadn't been gagged, there wasn't anything he could say. He tried again to access his power, but he was still blocked. A new thought froze his heart suddenly, but no, it, it couldn't be permanent. It had been too quick, too easy for that. Just a lightly cast spell, barely any effort or energy at all. Surely he would be able to cast again in time. He had to believe that, because the alternative was too horrible. Except he'd forgotten. There wasn't going to be any time. They were all about to die. I'm sorry, Meg, he thought sadly. Suddenly, Willem shot past him, launching himself at the mage, who was still turned toward Seniva. Seniva's eyes widened, and the mage whirled, but not quickly enough. Willem slammed into him and bore him back down to the ground. No, Seniva cried. She pulled Willem off the older man and thrust her son away from her. A burst of dark red magic energy from Mage Krellick's hands just missed him, shooting harmlessly up into the sky instead. They could all feel the power of it, though. Willem stumbled and fell back to the ground, shaking his head angrily. Kalen didn't know what Willem had thought would happen, although he appreciated the effort, but Willem was no match for a man of that much power. If this was what the mage was like when he was weak, Kalen was almost glad he wouldn't be around to see him at full strength. The thought alone was terrifying. The men around them had all backed away at the mage's display of magic. They weren't quite fleeing, but they clearly wanted to put as much distance as possible between themselves and what was happening here. Seneva had turned to face the mage and was reaching down once more to try to help him up and putting herself, Galen realized, between Krellick and her son. I am sorry, she said desperately. Please, he doesn't understand. The mage's eyes narrowed. Your other son? Sandiva licked her lips nervously. Yes. 
The mage was breathing heavily. He must really have been weakened from the crossover, and then the healing and the attempt on Willem. God, Scalen thought, how strong was he at full power? Slowly, Mage Krellig regained his feet. He stepped towards San Eva, and she backed away, but did not move from his path. Kalen felt ill. The mage was right in front of him now. I cannot have dissenters in my ranks, San Eva. That boy has just earned his death. He looked at her and smiled then, a ghastly evil expression. Don't worry, he said. You've lost a son before. I believe the second time is much easier. San Eva's face drained of color. He pushed her roughly aside and then looked at Willem, who was staring up at him defiantly. The mage was definitely slowing down. Kalen could see the flicker of the spell gathering this time before it struck. Kalen tried again, as hard as he could, to cast something, anything, a shield to divert the, the spell, a flame to set the man's spirit on fire, a dancing teacup to distract him, anything, anything. Willem was irritating and a problem and a liar, and Kalen still didn't trust him, but he didn't deserve to die. Not like this. But there was nothing Kalen could do to stop it. Then San Eva threw herself back in front of her son. The spell hit her straight on, and she screamed horribly, seeming to claw at herself for a few, the few seconds before the magic consumed her entirely. She crumpled within the fiery energy, the flames visible only to Kalen, but the effect on her body visible to them all. Kalen couldn't believe what he had just seen. No, Willem and Mage Krellig screamed together, each for his own reasons. Marl just screamed, burying her face back in Kalen's shoulder. Mage Krellig tore his eyes from St. Eva's blackened form and glared at Willem with a new hatred burning in his eyes. He took a step toward him. Willem didn't even notice. He was still staring at his mother's body. Another flickering of deep red began to gather at Mage Krellig's fingertips. He was definitely weaker. Each spell seemed to take a disproportionate amount of energy from him for reasons Kalen did not understand and could not begin to sort out at the moment. But Krellig still wasn't weak enough. It wouldn't take a strong spell to kill them, after all, just a thorough one, aimed with care, and Caleb and Kalen and Marl, at least, couldn't even try to run. Suddenly, a welcome roar sounded in the sky above them. Mage Krellig whipped his head around to stare. Jackal roared again, and Kalen could almost see the dragon's desire to burn the man to a crisp right there. Kalen did not think he had ever been so glad to see anyone in his entire life. Dimly, in the back of his mind, he realized that this was what San Eva had meant when she said Trellian had broken with Lauren. Meg and Jackal leaving the castle grounds must have ignited the start of the war, but he couldn't care very much about that right now. Meg was here, with her dragon, and all was not lost after all. Meg! Marl screamed, trying to struggle to her feet, but unable to quite manage it with her hands still bound behind her. Meg turned to locate her sister and stared in shock when she saw Caitlin. Jackal roared once more, shooting a stream of fire into the air before him. Now the black-clad men around them ran, scattering in all directions like beetles startled from under their rock. Mage Krellig seemed transfixed, staring up at the girl and the dragon, who had appeared so unexpectedly out of nowhere. Willem crawled quickly over and untied Kaelin's hands, then picked up Marl and ran for some of the nearby rocks. Kaelin ripped the gag from his mouth and started to follow. Marl was still screaming Meg's name, and this finally got the mage's attention. Kaelin looked back over his shoulder to see Mage Krellig staring furiously after them. Their eyes met suddenly, and Kaelin's legs nearly gave out beneath him at the insane power and rage he could see there. And then the mage's features shifted in confusion and surprise and pleasure, and suddenly the world stopped. Kaelin blinked and stumbled to a halt. It had literally stopped all around him. Meg and Jacka were suspended in the air mid-swoop. Marl's face was frozen, her mouth stretched into a scream. Willem was leaning forward, running for all he was worth. Except he wasn't, because no one was moving. No one but Kaelin and Mage Krellig. Interesting, Mage Krellig said, walking closer to Kaelin. What, what did you do? Kaelin asked. A million teeny dots of every color imaginable seemed to hang suspended in the air around them. A little parlor trick, Mage Krellig said airily. I can't hold it long, though, even at full strength, and I can't repeat it for several months at least, so we've only got a moment. He looked at Kaelin appraisingly. I know who you are. I've seen you. Kaelin tried to speak around his terror. You have? Not your face, he said this as though the face were something like a shirt that you could pull on and off at will. Your power. Your ability. Kaelin stared at him. What? I have had many useful visions over the years. I have seen you more than once, and I have sensed you. It was your magic at work in the room when I spoke with San Eva before she failed me the first time. You are of interest. The mage looked around at the other people present, chuckling as his eyes passed over Sarek again. Then he looked back at Kaelin and said, And here I thought I would have to go and seek you out. You will need to come with me. What? I, I can't do that. Of course you can. I've seen. 
that we might be of use to each other, he said. You have an unusual talent, do you not? I don't know what you're talking about. Of course, of course, Mage Krellick said. Then he winked. But you know that you are capable of much more than what you have done so far, don't you, my boy? You know that there are things being hidden from you about the ways of magic. That there are things you are never told to do that some mages do quite often. You know that the rules that bind you are like a prison, and you have already begun looking for the key. No, I haven't, Kaelin said. I don't even know what you mean. And the rules are, the rules are good. They keep, they keep, to keep people safe. And, and, Mage Krellig laughed again. Keep people safe, he repeated. Please. The Magistratum is trying to whip to tear your claws off, keeping you a mouse cat when you're meant to be a lion. You can't lie to me about this. I can tell. Your frustration radiates from you. You have tremendous power locked away inside, but clearly you've never been trained to really use it, or you wouldn't have been caught here as a prisoner of my, of our late friend. San Iba is not my friend, Kaelin snapped. No, no, of course not, which is all the worse for you. She could have eaten you for lunch anytime she wanted, but do you know she is not even that strong in the arts? Oh, she has had power, but it was the training, the knowledge that made her great the same knowledge that I could give you. <clears throat> I could give that, give you that and more, my boy. Everything you ever wanted to learn. No secrets, no limits, no restraints. Kalen shook his head. He didn't quite trust himself to speak because Mage Crowley was right about how badly Kalen wanted to learn. He was right about how Sarah kept holding him back, how the rules sometimes seemed like pointless obstacles. And hadn't he broken them on occasion? Hadn't he already decided for himself that some of the rules simply did not apply? Only some, he reminded himself, a very select number, and only with good reason. There's nothing to even think about here. But he was thinking about it all the same. No, he tried to focus on what was real, and what he knew to be true. Mage Krellig was a monster, an evil, crazy monster. And what he was offering was to turn Kalen into an evil, crazy monster too, like Seneva. Never. He should spit on Mage Krellig's offer. He should run now while the mage is busy holding this impossible spell. Run away so that when time started again, Kaelin would be out of reach and ready to be scooped up by Meg and Jackal to be taken back home to begin planning the fight against the most terrible enemy any of them had ever encountered. Except he wouldn't be part of that fight. Sarek wouldn't let him. Sarek would keep him in the dark, unable to help, unable to do anything to protect his home and his fellow mages and his friends. Mage Krellig was offering Kalen everything that Sarek refused to give. They told you you would be involved with him, the little voice inside him said. So go ahead. It's what they all expect you to do anyway. That was crazy. Mage Krellig was the enemy. Kalen could not. He would never. He could not believe he was even feeling the slightest bit of temptation. But he was. He couldn't deny it. Some small, teeny part of him was tempted to learn, to know everything he wanted to know. No limits, nothing held back. And then, beneath the temptation, another thought. Maybe this was the opportunity he was meant to look out for. Maybe the cards had been telling him about this, this very moment, about this chance to grab the knowledge he yearned for. Not that he would ever really join Mage Krellig. Of course not. He was no traitor. He could never put himself against Meg, or against Trellian, or against Sarek. Even when he couldn't stand his master, he didn't hate him, at least not most of the time. But if he could only pretend to join Mage Krellig, to go and learn and then come back, if he could pretend to join Mage Krellig in order to figure out how to defeat him, that was it. This was the chance he was being given. It had to be. And for a moment, he wavered on the brink of saying yes. He looked at Meg and the others, frozen in time. Meg, who had come here to save them. Meg, who was his best friend, his only friend, the only one who truly believed in him, the only one who needed him, who trusted him, she would not want him to do this. No, Kalen said, never. Mage Krellig started to laugh again, a deep, rich, booming sound that filled the frozen silence around them. Then he stopped abruptly. Ugh, he said, losing my hold. You've got about five more seconds to decide. His lingering, easy smile vanished. He looked directly into Kalen's eyes with deadly seriousness. And if you dare to refuse me again, you ignorant, mewling whelp, I will rip apart every single one of your little friends into unrecognizable strands of bloody, screaming flesh. Accept me, and I will let them live. He paused. For the time being, anyway. 
The world came abruptly back to life and motion. The first few seconds of sound were almost excruciating. Marl was shouting, Meg was screaming in tandem with Jackal, Sarek was beating against the inside of his shield prison, desperate to get free. Mage Kralik looked at Canley for one more long moment. Very well, he said. He turned toward the others, crimson streaks of magical energy gathering slowly about his hands, hands that were raised in the direction of Willem, of Marl, of Jackal, of Meg. Yes, Kalen heard himself say. Okay, yes, I'll come with you. Just don't, don't hurt. Jackal swooped down close above them, but the mage ignored him, beaming at Kalen. Excellent, he said, his good humor back in force. Let's go someplace where we can talk. Krellig gestured with one hand. There was an immediate answering cry of scream from not very far away, the all too familiar by now sound of the Slara. Jackal turned to face the direction the sound had come from, but a shouted word from Meg brought him back around. He dove again toward the ground, and a burst of pure and perfect orange fire streamed from his open mouth into the empty air. Meg was shouting, and Kaelin realized she was waiting for him to move away so she could attack Mage Krellig. He didn't move. The Slara appeared above the trees then, screaming again as it came for its master. Jackal turned and landed heavily beside the rocks, clearly following Meg's instructions against his own desire to engage the other creature in combat. Willem boosted Marl onto Jackal's back, then climbed up behind, beside her. Everyone turned to stare at Kaelin. Come on, Willem shouted, Kaelin! The Slara landed clumsily on the ground nearby and lay itself flat. Mage Krellig climbed up rather awkwardly. His casting was clearly catching up with him now. Kaelin didn't even want to imagine how much force of will and magic it would have taken to create the spell that had stopped time, let alone to hold it that way. Kaelin looked at Meg. He met her eyes, fierce and lovely and confused. His best, truest, only friend. He wished he could explain what he was doing. <clears throat> that he was doing this for her, for them, for all of them. But there was no time and no way. He dropped his eyes and climbed up behind Mage Krellig. His stomach heaved at the feel of the creature, creature's oozy skin beneath him, but he didn't turn back. He heard Meg screaming his name, and Marl too, and Sarek was throwing himself against his shield. <clears throat> he wished he could tell all of them why he was going, and that he would find a way to use this, to turn things around, that he would come back. He would come back. He would go with Mage Krellig and learn his secrets, and then, when the time came, he would be prepared to fight him, to destroy him forever. He couldn't help looking back at Meg once more as the Slara lumbered into the air. Her face, as she watched him ride off, was like a knife in his heart. <clears throat>